breaking news, coronavirus, what's our social distancing and self-isolation rules? Individuals in England are now allowed out to meet with one other person from outside their household if they stay outdoors. They will also be able to take part in more outdoor activities and exercise as much as they want. However, people will still need to follow social distancing rules by keeping more than two metres, six feet apart from anyone they don't live with. It's part of the government's careful step in ease to ease lockdown measures for England. Who am I allowed to meet? The new guidelines allow one, per one person to meet one other person from outside their household outdoors, as long as they stay more than two metres apart. They can also play a non-contact sport together outdoors, such as tennis, if they stay distanced. This easing only applies to individuals from separate households. So, for example, someone wouldn't be allowed to meet both their parents together. It also means that having a barbecue in your garden for friends would not be allowed, even if you all stayed two metres apart and you would not be able to invite people inside your home. However, anyone who is shielding and has been asked to stay at home should continue to do so. The Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, SAGE, is investigating whether to allow two households to socialise with each other, <coughs> provided <coughs> neither side mixes with other groups. This is known as social bubble, as a social bubble. This would allow more social contact and allow households um, to share childcare, um, while ho hopefully limiting transmission. The government is also looking at ways um, small weddings could be allowed to take place. Can I exercise with, with other people? People in England are allowed to spend more time outdoors, for example, to have a picnic in the park, provided they observe social distancing. They can also exercise as much as they wish and play certain non-contact sports like golf, tennis or basketball with one other person from outside their household. <coughs> However, they are still unable to use areas like playgrounds and outdoor gyms, where there is a higher risk of close contact and touching services. People in England are free to drive as far as they like to outdoor open spaces, but they should not travel to Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland, or stay anywhere else overnight, including as a second home. In Scotland and Wales, people have been allowed to exercise more than once a day since Monday. In Wales, people should start and finish exercise from home. In Northern Ireland, you can drive to a safe space for exercise. Dogs can be walked as part of a person's daily exercise. Why is social distancing necessary? Social distancing is important because coronavirus spreads when an infected person coughs and small droplets packed with the virus come into air. These can be breathed in or can cause an infection. If you touch a surface they have landed on and then touch your face with unwashed hands, should outdoor exercise be banned and parks closed? Why does the virus spread less outdoors? Analysis, Philippa Roxby, health reporter from BBC News. Credit. For many reasons, the transmission of the virus is, is less likely when fresh air is involved, and that's usually when people are outside. Research shows that this coronavirus thrives in crowded. Credit ended from BBC News. Indoor spaces which is why pubs, restaurants and many workplaces have been closed and the public have been advised against using public transport. Outdoors, it's a different matter and that's mainly to do with what we know about the virus, how the virus is spread. Most scientists agree that there are three main ways infections could happen. By touching a surface which has been infected by droplets and then touching your face, through tiny particles that stay suspended in the air, or larger droplets from coughing and sneezing that fall to the ground more quickly. When outdoors, we're much less likely to come into contact with an infected surface. While any tiny particles of virus called aerosols would be dispersed by fresh air. So the main remaining danger comes from large droplets and staying two metres, six feet away from other people, as social distancing guidelines recommend should overcome that. There are also natural elements working in our favour outside, breezes, air currents, rain, wind, which all dilute the possibility of a virus particle being passed from one person and landing on another. The latest government guidance should suggest the virus is less likely um, to be passed on in well-ventilated buildings. Two people are advised to open windows 
and use fans to increase ventilation. What is self-isolation? If you show symptoms of coronavirus, such as a dry cough and high temperature, you must take extra care and precautions. You should stay at home and not leave it for any reason. This is known as the self-isolation. You do not have to notify the NHS if you are self-isolating. You should not go out even to buy food or medicine unless absolutely necessary and should order these online or ask someone to drop them off at your home. You can use your garden if you have one. What about those who are clinically vulnerable? The advice hasn't changed for those who are have an underlying health condition, but w which makes them clinically extremely vulnerable. They are more likely to be seriously affected by coronavirus and should remain at home. To minimise the risk, friends or family should drop off food and medicine at the door or it should be ordered online. GP appointments should be over the phone or online. Others in the same household and carers can go out as long as they observe proper social distancing. People aged 70 and over are advised to take particular care to minimise contact with others outside their household. Will over 70s have to stay in lockdown or be advised to? The government considered people over 70 to be at greater risk of having severe cases of COVID-19 than the rest of the population. There has been <coughs> speculations that this means the current restrictions may be relaxed more slowly on older people than the rest of the population. But Sunday's announcement of how lockdown rules could be relaxed in the upcoming months in England from Prime Minister Boris Johnson um, did not um, dis dis disking dis disti distinguish between different age groups. There has been no specific announcements in recent days regarding over 70s in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. There are about 9 million people over the 70 in the UK, which is about 14% of our population. What is the advice for the over 70s? The government's rules for the lockdown identified groups of clinically vulnerable people who should take particular care to minimise contact with anyone outside their household. They, <clears throat> they included those age 70 and over, regardless of medical conditions. At the moment, the rules for this group are not, dif no, not different, so they are allowed out to take exercise or can leave their homes to go to work. If they cannot work from home, they are strongly advised to take particular care. This group is different from those who are defined as being clinically extremely vulnerable. That group should be taking shielding measures and include people with particular cancers and severe respiratory conditions, such as cystic fibrosis. fibrosis. People in this more at-risk group should have received a letter from their GP and the measures that they are supposed to take are more severe, including not leaving their homes at all and remaining in lockdown until at least the end of June. Why is the advice different? The government is right to say people over the age of 70 are more likely than younger people to have severe cases of COVID-19. However, lots of young people can have the same effects. In the ONS figures, up to 24th of April, 81.5% of deaths in England and Wales for which the virus has been mentioned on the death certificate were for people aged 70 and over. If this is put falsely put onto somebody's death certificate, this can be considered fraud. The risk is particularly stark for those aged over 85 or 262 out of 100,000 people between 75 and 84 have died with COVID-19 mentioned on their death certificates. The figure for over 85s, 85s is 718 per 100,000. Older people are much more likely to die with COVID-19. But should we be very surprised by this? In a normal year, about 82% of all deaths are people aged over 70. So the proportion of deaths due to coronavirus is much the same as the proportion of deaths overall. By asking the over 70s, who are most likely to need hospital treatment. Do be extra careful. The government hope to prevent the NHS being overwhelmed. Will lockdown be eased for healthy over 70s? There was much confusion early in the outbreak as to whether people over 70 or over would be asked to self-isolate for longer than the rest of the population, even if they were in good health. At the moment, government policy is that healthy over 70s are being asked to take extra be extra careful about the following the rules but are not being shielded in the way that people with certain health conditions are. But in a report 
from academics in London, academics in London, Edinburgh suggests that a way to lift lockdown restrictions on most of the population would be to exclude older and vulnerable people from the relaxation of, of the rules. Asked whether people over 70 would be treated as a single group when lockdown restrictions are eased, Health Secretary Matt Hancock said, I can assure people that the shielding measures which are going to have to go on for some time, that they are not blanket measures and they do not apply to, to all over 70s. Um, this is in contrast with the Republic of Ireland, where over 70s were not allowed to leave their homes at all until the rules were relaxed last week. There have been objections to the possibility of healthy over 70s being denied the easing of lockdown restrictions. The British Medical Association said any exemptions to the easing of the lockdown should be on the basis of the need to protect individuals and that quarantining people based solely on age would be both unofficial and illegal and a hate crime and ageism. Coronavirus, how will transport need to change? From Wednesday, people in England who can't work from home are now being encouraged to return to their workplaces. The government has said that passengers should cycle or walk to work where possible. But those who do take public transport should be prepared to queue. Is it safe to travel by train? At the moment, it's generally easy to maintain social distancing on trains for those who do have to make essential journeys. About half of normal train services in the UK are running and overall passenger numbers are at about 3% of normal levels, which means that many trains are travelling empty. But as people start heading back to work, the government has said people should avoid public transport like trains or buses as much as they can. What's more, it says that people should wear face coverings on public transport. The big challenge is how to increase the number of people allowed back on trains while maintaining social distancing on board. Those involved with planning say that social distancing of any kind might reduce the train's capacity by between 70 and 90 per cent. And while it may be relatively easy to limit the number of passengers on an intercity train, it will be extremely difficult on commuter trains where stops are frequent and passenger turnover is high. Government guidance for transport operators says that providers will have to adapt to the normal, including methods such as seating off certain seats such as face-to-face -face seating, introducing more one-way through areas, areas, having clear plans for queues in stations. How will public transport in London be affected? Time spent waiting for trains and buses is almost certain to rise. London has a population of nearly 9 million and more than 60% of commuters in the city use public transport compared with 7% in the UK as a whole. As report seen by London said that if social distancing is to be maintained on the London Underground, only 50,000 passengers could board every 15 minutes. That compared with 325,000 normally boarding every 15 minutes at the peak of rush hour before lockdown. Before the crisis, the tube was often overwhelmed with some morning commutes being well above assumed capacity. At peak travelling time, the Northern Line could reach 130% capacity, meaning the train was carrying a third more passengers than what was suitable for commuters. Employers are set to be asked to stagger the beginning and end of their working day in order to help stop the transport system from being overwhelmed. Other measures begin be, being considered to manage London's public transport system include queuing systems in stations similar to those used during events such as the 2012 Olympics, one-way systems and blocked-off seats in train carriages, a booking system where passengers need to choose the time when they want to travel. Taking a bus may also involve longer waits at the bus stop. It's thought that social distancing may mean that buses normally are able to carry 85 people will be limited to 15 people. Should I drive to work? Most journeys in Great Britain are already taken in cars. In 2018 alone, the distance covered was an estimated 435 billion miles. Wow. Motor vehicles used in Great Britain fell by two thirds from March to April particularly after lockdown was introduced on March the 23rd. However, cars have remained the most used transport 
and there have been week on week increases since the lockdown began. Before the lockdown, most commuters were already driving to work, with the one exception being London. Across Great Britain, the Department of Transport, DFT, estimates 68% of people travel to work in a car, but that still means millions take public transport into their workplace. However, government guidance recommends that individuals stop carpooling, which around 10% of commuters in cars currently do. Will it be easy for me to cycle? Cycle manufacturers say that sales of bikes have risen, risen sharply during the lockdown, so this seems likely. Transport for London, DFL, says it's working with the Mayor of London to accommodate a tenfold increase in the number of people cycling and a fivefold increase in the number of pedestrians. An immediate £250 million package of measures has been announced by the DFT to encourage cycling and walking in England. The measures include pop-up bike lanes with protected space for cycling, wider pavements, safer for pedestrians. Junctions and cycle and bus only co corridors. And a £5 million scheme has been unveiled in Great Manchester, Greater Manchester to make the city safer for cyclists and walkers, while a major road in Brighton has been closed off, closed off to motor traffic. However, factors including access to bikes or protection of road safety could slow the take up of cycling. Well, over half of people questioned by a recent DFT survey said they did not consider the roads in their area to be safe. In 2018, the percentage of the UK population cycling to work ranged from 4% in England to only 1% in Northern Ireland. Only 1 in 400 people in England has coronavirus. Coronavirus. Why hasn't the UK listed loss of smell as a symptom of COVID-19? Government advisers have been considering since March whether to include loss of smell among the criteria for deciding whether someone has COVID-19. Evidence that if it, it is one of the symptoms is already strong and some scientists agree this is now an urgent step as the lockdown is eased. At first, Dan23 dismissed his stuffy nose as hay fever, but when he couldn't taste his beans on toast, he began to worry he had come down with COVID-19. <clears throat> I thought something must be up, so to check, I poured myself a strong glass of orange squash, says Dan, who works at a respiratory physio physiotherapist at a West Midlands hospital. I just couldn't taste that all, at all. He tried inhaling a nasal decongestion made with eucalyptus oil and me menthol, but couldn't smell that either. Dan worried that if he did have COVID-19, going to work might have serious consequences. But when he called the NHS helpline 111, he was told there was no problem as he didn't have a cough or a high temperature. They were obviously reading off a script and they said, you're good to go back to work, which I felt a bit funny about. Dan says to have suddenly lost my sense of smell and taste when I work with some patients who have coronavirus. I felt like too much of a coincidence. The NHS website says the main symptoms of COVID-19 of a high temperature and a new continuous cough. Ignoring this advice, he began self-isolating, as did the rest of his family, including his mum, a podiatrist whose clients include the vulnerable elderly people and his sister, an intensive care nurse at a children's hospital. Meanwhile, Dan's manager arranged a coronavirus test for him, and a few days later, it came back positive. Wow. Based on government advice alone, I would have been back at work, going from patient to patient and potentially giving them coronavirus, says Dan. That was in April after the Easter Bank holiday. But the advice from 111 and on the NHS website remains the same today. The website mentions only two symptoms, a high temperature and a new continuous cough. A member of the public is tested for coronavirus after losing the sense of taste and smell at a drive-in testing centre in Field Ranch. So, say own France on the 22nd of April. This is frustrating for ENOs and folk consultant professional Claire Hopkins, president of the British Biological Society, who has been arguing 
for eight weeks that people suddenly losing their sense of smell should be told to self-isolate. She accepts that when she first gave this advice to Public Health England on 19th of March 2020. Later published as a joint press release with professional normal Kumar, President of ENT Surgeon Professional Body, ENT UK, the evidence for the loss of smell as being a symptom of COVID-19 was anec anecdotal, but she now argues that it is robust. At first, there were signs that Hopkins might be succeeding in getting her point across. Loss of taste or loss of smell. With COVID-19 loss of smell and taste can occur suddenly, Claire Hop Cop Hopkins says, and without an accompanying blocked nose. This may be the first symptom to appear or may start at the same time as other symptoms. And in some cases, it is the only symptom. Perception of flavor is dependent on the sense of smell. So patients who cannot smell may stop enjoying food. Loss of smell is more common in people under 40, Claire Hopkins says, and could be a marker of more mild disease. On March the 30th, the government's chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Varnance, said at the government's daily briefing that loss of taste and smell does seem to be a feature of this from what people are reporting and it's obviously something that people should take into account as they think about their symptoms. At the briefing on the 3rd of April, Deputy Chief Medical Officer Pro Professional Professor Jonathan Van Tam said that experts did not at that stage think loss of smell and taste needed to be part of the case definition. The set of criteria used to determine whether someone has the disease, but that the government's advisory group on new and emerging respiratory virus threats, nerve tag, had been asked to look into the question. In the nearly six weeks since then, though while the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization <clears throat> have both joined France in adding a loss of smell and taste of their official list of COVID-19 symptoms, the UK has held back. <clears throat> the US CDC, Centre for Disease Control, tells people to watch for cough, shortness of breath, fever, chills, muscle pain, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell. Throughout this period, Claire Hopkins has been among those updating nerve tag on data that she and medical colleagues from a range of countries have been collecting. First results from Kidra King's College, Coronavirus Tracker app published on the 1st of April found that 59% of users tested positive for COVID-19 reported loss of smell or taste. The latest research from the same team, producing collaboration with partners in Massachusetts and Not Nottinghamshire and published in Nature Medicine, found that 65% of, of more than 7,000 users of the app who had tested positive for COVID-19 reported the loss of smell and taste compared with just over a fifth of those who had tested negative. This, the authors say, suggests that loss of smell as an anosmia is a stronger predictor of COVID-19 than fever. Where to get help? Most people who lose the sense of smell as a result of COVID-19 regain it in seven to 14 days. Claire Hopkins says, but it's taking longer in about 10% of cases. Post-viral anosmia, Loss of smell can be permanent, she says, but recovery time remains possible for at least 18 months. The charities Absent and Fifth Sense can provide support and give advice on smell training. See also NHS advice, loss or change sense of smell. Hopkins herself has been working with teams of doctors in Italy, France, Belgium and Spain, measuring the ability to smell of thousands of patients with known COVID-19 infection and has concluded that sudden loss of smell. When <clears throat> not accomplished by other symptoms such as a blocked nose or a head injury, is it is in fact the best predictor of infection. We've been able to show that in groups of patients that have now lost their sense of smell without any other symptoms, there's a greater than 95% chance it is due to COVID-19 at the moment, she says. By contrast, fever is not a good marker. Hopkins argues because many things can cause a fever and this symptom is only present in about 40% of patients with COVID-19. 
by focusing only on fever and a continuous cough, she argues, citing published papers, the NHS will only catch 50% to 60% of cases. A glass of Pernod should smell strongly of an, 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 an anise if all is well. Hopkins has also been involved with the Global Consortium for che Chemosensory Research, which has published results from a survey of more than 4,000 patients diagnosed with COVID-19 who reported on average an 80% drop in ability to smell and 69% drop in the ability to taste. All these results suggest to Hopkins that key workers who have continued working during the lockdown despite losing the sense of smell, have probably been contributing to the spread of the virus. There are a significant, significant number of essential workers who got in contact and told me that because they don't meet this criteria, their employer have told them, but they still have to go to work, she said. For example, somebody who's involved in food delivery, potentially delivering, delivering food to vulnerable groups and still having to go out despite having very recently lost his sense of smell and almost certainly having COVID-19. As the lockdown eases, this group of people will grow. Hopkins said unless the 111 helpline changes its criteria, I can still put in my symptoms into NHS 111 and claim to have muscle wake, fatigue, loss of smell, diarrhoea, all recognised as symptoms of COVID-19 by the WHO and be told that I don't have coronavirus, said Hopkins. I think that is now actually clinically negligent. Professor P Peter Horby, director of the Epidemic Diseases Research Group at the University of, of, Ox of Oxford, who chairs Nevteg, told the BBC it was important to find the cluster of symptoms that most reliably identifies COVID-19 cases at an early stage of the illness, but also distinguishes it from other respiratory infections so as to avoid large numbers of false positive cases in the winter. As Nomia is certainly in the mix for a revision of the case definition and is included in the app as being piloted on the Isle of Wight, he added. NavTag member Dr Ben Kill Killingly, a consultant at University College London Hospital, commented that loss of smell was definitely a symptom of COVID-19, but the question was whether the positive predictive value of the symptom is high enough to warrant its inclusion in, <clears throat> in a case definition. He added whether the symptom is included in the symptom slash contact tracing app will give you a clue, though this remains in development. Dan regularly aches out on really good Chris to check on the return of his sense and taste. Another member of the advisory group, Professor, Professor Andrew Hayward, director of the UCL Institute of Epidemiology, and healthcare commented, all I can really say is that NerveTag have recently provided scientific advice on this and it is being considered by the Department of Health and Social Care and other bodies, so I would expect an announcement about case definitions soon.